liturgical year of Don Prosper Garanger, October 1st, Saint Remigius, Bishop and Confessor, Apostle of the Franks. Scarcely had two centuries elapsed since the triumph of the cross over Roman idolatry when Satan began to cry victory once more. While Eutychianism was crowned at Byzantium in the person of Anastasius the Silent, Arianism was rife in the West. Throughout the whole ancient territory of the empire, heresy was supreme and almost everywhere was persecuting the church, who had now none but the vanquished for her sons. But fear not, rather rejoice, says Baronius at this point in his annals. It is divine wisdom still delighting to play in the world. The thoughts of men count for little before him who holds the light in his hands, to hide it when he pleases and when he wills, to bring it forth again. The darkness that now covers the earth marks the hour when the dawn is about to break in the hearts of the frocks, and the Catholic faith is to shine there in all its glory. Little known in our days is such a manner of writing history, yet this was the view taken by the first historian of the church and the greatest. On such a feast as this, we could not do better than repeat summarily his account of the frocks. How, says he, can we help admiring that providence which is never wanting to the church, from the mist of tribes still pagan, on the morrow of the irremediable fall of the empire, God forms to himself a new people, raises unto himself a prince. Against these must break the rising tide of heretics and barbarians. Such in truth appeared in the course of ages the divine mission of the Frankish kings. What energy has faith to uphold kingdoms? And what fatal power has heresy to uproot every plant that is not set by our Heavenly Father? In proof hereof, see how the principalities of the Goths, Vandals, Heruli, Ali, Jepidi have utterly disappeared, while the Franks behold their little spot of earth blessedly fertilized and encroaching far upon the surrounding territories. Henceforth appeared the might of the Franks, when proceeded to battle by the cross, hitherto obscure and struggling for existence. They were now everywhere victorious. They had only had to acknowledge Christ in order to reach the highest summit of glory, honor, and renown. In so speaking, I say nothing but what is known to the whole world. If they have been more favored than other nations, it is because they were supereminent in faith and incomparable in piety, so that they were more eager to defend the church than to protect their own frontiers. Moreover, a privilege unique and truly admirable was theirs. Never did the sons of kings bring upon this people as upon so many others, subjection to the foreign yoke. The promise of the psalm would seem to have been renewed in favor of this nation. If his children forsake my law and keep not my commandments, I will visit their iniquities with a rod, but my mercy I will not take away from him. All honor then to the saintly pontiff who merited to be the instrument of such heavenly benefits. According to the expression of the holy pope Hermistas, Remigius converted the nation and baptized Clovis in the midst of prodigies similar to those of the apostolic age. The prayers of Clotilde and labors of Genevieve, the penances of the monks who peopled the forests of Gaul, had doubtless a great share in a conversion which brought such joy to the angels. Did space allow, we might relate how it was also prepared by the great bishops of the 5th century, Germanus of Auxerre. Lupus of Troyes, Anian of Orléans, Hilary of Arles, Mermertus and Avitus of Vienne, Sidonius Apollinarius, and so many others who, in that age of darkness, held up the church to the light of day and commanded the respect of the barbarians. Remigius, contemporary and survivor of most of them, and their rival in eloquence, nobility, and holiness, seemed to personify them all on that Christmas night forestalled by so many desires, prayers, and sufferings. In the baptistry of St. Mary's at Reims, the Frankish nation was born to God, as heretofore on the banks of the Jordan, the dove was again seen over the waters, honoring this time not the baptism of Jesus, but that of the church's eldest daughter. It brought a gift from heaven, the holy vial containing the chrism which was to anoint the French kings in future ages 
into the most worthy of all the kings of the earth. Two churches in the city of Reims claim the honor of these glorious souvenirs, the Grand Church of Our Lady and the Venerable Basilica where Remigius lay with the vile chrism at his feet and guarded by the twelve peers surrounding his splendid mausoleum. This church of St. Remigius bore the name of Caput Francie, head of all France, until those days of October 1793 when, from its desecrated pulpit, was proclaimed the word of the days of darkness were at an end, when the holy ampulla was broken and the relics of the Apostle of France were thrown into a common grave. They were, however, afterwards discovered and authentically recognized and are to this day an object of the greatest veneration of pilgrims. After an episcopate of 74 years, the longest ever recorded in history, Remigius took his flight to heaven on the 13th of January, the anniversary of his episcopal consecration and also of his birth. Yet in the same century, the 1st of October was chosen for his feast, this being the day whereon his relics were first translated to a more honorable place in the midst of miracles such as those which had graced his life. The translation of St. Remigius is the name still given to this day by the Church of Reims, which, by a special privilege, celebrates on the octave day of the Epiphany the principal festival of its glorious patron. We borrow the following lessons from the office of that day. Remigius, also called Remedius, was born at Lyon, of noble parents by name Emilius and St. Selenia. They were far advanced in age and renowned among their own people for their virtue when the birth of this child was foretold to them by a blind hermit named Montanius, who afterwards recovered his sight by applying to his eyes some of the milk wherewith the infant Remigius was nourished. The future apostle of the Franks devoted his youth to prayer and study in retirement, but the more he shrank from the company of men, the more his fame spread throughout the province. In the death of Venadius, Archbishop of Reims, Remigius, who though but 22 years of age, had the mature character of an old man, was unanimously elected or rather forcibly installed as archbishop. He endeavored to escape the burden of the episcopate, but was obliged by the command of God to submit. Having been consecrated by the bishops of the province, he governed his church with the wisdom of an experienced veteran. He was eloquent, learned in the scriptures, and a pattern to his people, fulfilling indeed what he taught by word. He carefully and laboriously instructed his own flock in the mysteries of faith, and established discipline among his clergy. Then he undertook to spread the kingdom of Christ in Belgium, and having converted the people to the faith, he founded several new bishoprics and appointed them pastors at Terouane, St. Antimund or Almont, at Arras, St. Bedest, and at Léon, St. Genebald. The wonderful works of Remigius, being divulged far and wide, filled with astonishment the minds of Clovis and his still pagan Franks. When Clovis, who had already conquered the Gauls, triumphed over the Alemanni, also at the Battle of Tolbiac, by the invocation of the name of Christ, he sent for Remigius and willingly listened to his explanation of the Christian doctrine. Remigius urged the king to embrace the faith, but he replied that he feared the opposition of his people. When this was reported to the Franks, they cried out with one voice, We renounce mortal gods, O pious king, and are ready to follow the immortal God whom Remigius preaches. Then the bishop imposed a fast upon them, according to the custom of the church, and having in the presence of the queen, St. Clotilde, completed the king's religious instruction, he baptized him on the day of our Lord's nativity, addressing him in these words, Bow down thy head in meekness, O Sycambrian, adore what thou hast hitherto burnt, burn what thou hast adored. After the baptism, he anointed him with holy chrism with the sign of the cross of Christ. More than 3,000 of the army were baptized, as also Albofledia, Clovis's sister, who died soon after, upon which occasion Remigius wrote to console the king. His other sister, Lanthilda, was reclaimed 
from the Arian heresy anointed with sacred chrism and reconciled to the church. Remigius was exceedingly liberal to the poor and merciful towards sinners. God has not placed us here, he would say, to exercise wrath, but to take care of men. During a council, he once, by divine power, struck an Arian bishop with dumbness until he begged forgiveness by signs, when he restored him his speech with these words, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, if thou holdest the right belief concerning him, speak and confess the faith of the Catholic Church. The bishop, recovering his voice, protested that he believed and would die in that faith. Towards the end of his life, Remigius lost his sight, but recovered it shortly before his death. Knowing the day of his departure, he celebrated Mass and fortified his flock with the sacred body of Christ. Then he bade his clergy and people farewell, giving to each one the kiss of our Lord's peace. And full of days and good works, he departed this life on the Ides of January in the year of our Lord 533, being 96 years old. He was buried in the oratory of St. Christopher, and as in life, so also after death, he was famous for miracles. This is a fitting occasion to bring forward the beautiful formula rightly called the Prayer of the Franks, which dates from the first ages of the monarchy. Almighty Eternal God, who didst establish the empire of the Franks to be throughout the world the instrument of thy divine will and the sword and bulwark of thy holy church, ever and in all places prevent, we beseech thee, with thy heavenly light, the suppliant sons of the Franks, so that they may both see what they ought to do to promote thy kingdom in this world, and, in order to fulfill what they have seen, may continually increase in charity and in valor. St. Leo IX said to his contemporaries, and we echo his words concerning the land of France, Be it known to your charity that you must solemnly celebrate the feast of the blessed Remigius, for it to others he is not an apostle, he is such with regard to you at least, Pay such honor then to your apostle and father, that you may merit, according to the divine promise, to live long upon the earth and, by his prayers, may obtain possession of eternal beatitude. When he thus spoke, the sovereign pontiff has just consecrated thy church, then for the third time rebuilt with the magnificence required by the growing devotion of the people. The nine centuries since elapsed had augmented thy claims to the gratitude of a nation, into which Thou didst infuse such vigorous life, that no other has equaled it in duration. Accept our thanks, O Thou, who wast our new Sylvester to our new Constantine. Glory be to our Lord, who showed forth his wonders in Thee, remembering those gestes of God accomplished in all climes by her sons the Franks. The Church recognizes, in the Reims lectionary, the legitimacy of applying to Thee the beautiful words which announced the Messiah. Give ear, ye islands, and hearken, ye people, from afar. The Lord hath called me from the womb, and he said, Behold, I have given thee to be the light of the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation even to the farthest part of the earth. Truly it was a day of salvation, that Christmas day, whereon it pleased our Lord to bless thy labors and grant the desires of thy long episcopate. By the holy faith thou taughtest, Thou wast then the covenant of the people, the new people composed to the conquerors and the conquered in that land of France, which, when once itself raised up, soon restored to God the inheritances that had been destroyed. O true church, the one only bride, captive and destitute, behold, Remigius rises to say to thy sons that are bound, Come forth, and to them that are in darkness, show yourselves. From north and south, from beyond the sea, behold, they come in multitudes. All these are come to thee. Therefore give praise, O ye heavens, and rejoice, O earth, because the Lord hath comforted his people after a whole century of heresy and barbarity. God has once more demonstrated that they shall not be confounded that wait for him. Our confidence in God will again be rewarded if thou, O Remigius, deign to present to our Lord the prayer of the Franks, who have remained faithful in honoring thy memory. The renegades sold over to Satan may tyrannize for a time over the deluded crowd, but they are not the nation. A day will come when Christ, who is ever king, 
will say to the angels of his guard those words of his lieutenant Clovis, It displeases me that these Goths possess the good land of France. Expel them, for it belongs to us.